Starship launches are coming to Florida. How many exactly? We have some new documents with information about the two Starship pads planned for LC-37 at Cape Canaveral. Also, President Trump has just signed an executive order repealing the ban on supersonic aviation in the United States. And finally, the Senate is responding to the White House budget for NASA, and yeah, they want to keep SLS. So first, let's talk about the Starship news out of Florida. The Department of the Air Force just released SpaceX's Starship Super Heavy Cape Canaveral Space Force Station Environmental Impact Statement, which is a pretty long document, but I just want to give you the highlights. So if approved, SpaceX would launch Starship from Slick 37 up to 76 times per year. This would also include 76 Starship static fire tests, 76 super heavy static fire tests, 76 super heavy landings, and 76 Starship landings. Approximately half of the launches would occur during daytime and half during night. And it's assumed that up to 20% of the annual launches would be scrubbed. This is also interesting. It says most of the landings would return to the launch site. However, several landings per year could be expendable or occur on a floating platform. So they're bringing back those oil rigs, right? So SpaceX would construct launch landing and support infrastructure at SLC or Slick 37. This infrastructure would include launch pads, launch mounts, integration towers, a launch diverter or trench structures, landing pads, and landing catch towers test stands. Much of like what we already see in Starbase, Texas. And so we can get an idea of what that would look like with this map here of the two Starship pads planned for LC-37 at Cape Canaveral. Here's also an interesting map of the Starship reentry landing sonic boom range. And it looks like SpaceX will be needing 450 employees for the operations at Slick 37. And on this map, we can see the Starship potential oceanic landing areas for an expendable scenario. And remember, SpaceX also plans to launch Starship from LC-39A at Kennedy Space Center. Construction of that Starship orbital launch pad began a while ago in 2021, but there has been significant progress recently, including the stacking of tower segments and infrastructure development like a flame trench and water deluge system. SpaceX aims to complete this pad, adopting the design of Starbase's Pad B in Texas, and those launches could start as early as late 2025, but we'll see. So these plans in this draft environmental impact statement are for the Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, which was previously used for United Launch Alliance's Delta IV rockets. And these operations are targeted to begin by 2026. So that's pretty exciting, and I should also add that SpaceX shared that they had a full duration static fire of all 33 Raptor engines on a super heavy booster ahead of Starship's next flight test. And so, of course, this is booster 16, and it will be featured in the upcoming flight 10 of Starship, the first double digit flight. It's very hard to believe that. So that will be coming up soon. An exact date certainly hasn't been announced yet, but it's always a good sign when SpaceX is posting about their tests. And so we'll see. I will, of course, keep you up to date on when exactly that launch will be for your planning purposes. Plus, it's a huge day in the United States. Supersonic air travel is back. Back in 1973, a ban was placed on supersonic flight over the U.S. It was supposed to protect the public from sonic booms, but instead it banned innovation. As Blake Scholl writes, the result crippled progress for half a century. The trend of ever-increasing flight speeds ground to a halt. However, today, finally, quiet supersonic flight is allowed. Boom Aero recently proved that this was possible on the first privately developed supersonic jet. The supersonic race is on and a new era of commercial flight can begin. So this executive order will promote supersonic aviation in the United States. The order directs the administrator of the FAA to repeal the prohibition on overland supersonic flight, establish an interim noise-based certification standard, and repeal other regulations that hinder supersonic flight. So this is a pretty exciting development, and American companies developing supersonic aircraft have already entered into government contracts and agreements with major commercial airlines like United and American Airlines who have committed to purchase supersonic jets to enhance their fleets with faster travel options. Who wouldn't want that? And finally, 
is SLS going to stay in the picture? Well, this is something that we were hoping to answer because we were thinking that Jared Isaacman would be the new head of NASA and we would get to hear his grand vision and plans for NASA. However, since he is no longer going to lead NASA, what is going to happen with the SLS program? Well, the Senate is wanting to keep it going. During my hearing, uh, one senator was really grilling me a lot of like, what well, really, what's the difference between, you know, moon and Mars? And, uh, you know, isn't moon the stepping stone? I'm like, well, one's a planet, you know, and, uh, you know, it has an atmosphere. And if you looked at the moon, it doesn't look pretty. I mean, it's getting beat up all the time. It has no protection from, you know, for solar radiation. So reality is like you should go to the moon if it because for 35 years we said we were going to. And I think that's very important. You know, it, it, it's 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 very late in the game to say, well, we did it in the 60s and early 70s. You know, that would have been the fine position to state the entire time that we've done it and we're moving on. But we didn't. For 35 years, we said we're going back and we spent over 100 billion of taxpayer dollars saying we were going to do it. And for us not to be able to do it now and watch China do it, like I said, it, it's it signals a far greater disease across our, our government and, and how our system operates. And I don't think we want that reckoning. So look, we paid for the hardware anyway. We, let, let's go back, but let's parallel going to Mars. So that's what Artemis is really about. I mean, you can say Artemis is about Mars too, but that's like 100 years down the line. And like I said, it's a giant disposable rocket program that repurposes shuttle hardware. It's incredibly expensive. We signed up a lot of international partners to support it because we like collecting flags. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always mean that what they're contributing to is in the best interest of the program. Case in point, you know, we had, you know, Gateway, uh, man, like we, this is going down a rabbit hole of a lot of things because of the shortcomings of the vehicle, but it's expensive, it's disposable. It is not the way to do uh, affordable, repeatable, efficient exploration, whether it's to moon, Mars, or anywhere else. So let's get it done and then focus on the on the right way to go about doing this so that we're not seeing people walk on the moon every five years or something crazy, that it's happening all the time, which is what we get excited about. No matter how expensive, no matter how delayed, they are fighting to keep SLS and even Gateway in the mix. Now, the U.S. federal budget for fiscal year 2026 is still being negotiated. However, the chair on the Committee of Commerce, Science and Transportation, Senator Ted Cruz, released some directives that show exactly where he wants that money going. As Eric Berger reports in an Ars Technica article, Ted Cruz is calling for additional funding for at least Artemis IV and Artemis V. The Trump administration is looking to cancel SLS after Artemis III, the first moon landing, but Ted Cruz and others are still fighting to keep it going beyond Artemis III. The Trump administration also has called for the cancellation of Gateway, which is the small space station to be built in an elongated lunar orbit. Ted Cruz says Congress should fully fund the Gateway as critical infrastructure. As Eric reports, this legislation, the committee said in a messaging document, quote, dedicates almost $10 billion to win the new space race with China and ensure America dominates space, makes targeted critical investments in Mars forward technology, Artemis missions and moon to Mars program and the ISS. So will the SLS or space launch system rocket continue beyond Artemis three? Well, Congress sure hopes so. But again, it will take some time for these decisions and for this budget to be finalized. So I'm hoping that NASA actually selects a new leader soon so that we can have some more clarity in these decisions that need to be made. But I want to know what you guys think. Do you guys still think that SLS should be scrapped and canceled after Artemis 3? Or do you think that they should continue funding and have an Artemis 4 and an Artemis 5 and Gateway and so on? Thanks so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Ellie in Space, and I'll see you in the next video.